Australia. There is nothing like it in the world. From our fabulous coastlines to this amazing outback. And I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time in the outback with my tour company, Darrell Beatty Adventures. But there is one trip that is that extra special to me, and that is the Canning Stock Route. This is the last frontier, one of the most remote and isolated tracks in the world. And that's what really appeals to me. Established as a stock route in 1910, still a massive challenge today, and will test the most experienced adventurer. Join me and my mate, Kevin Swance, and a group of ordinary Australians on this epic journey across the Canning Stock Route. I'm excited. On a Daryl Beatty adventure from um, Waluna all the way up to Halls Creek, and um, yeah, it's something I had to come do. Uh, you know, I, I, I miss the comforts of, of Austin, Texas in my king size bed, but you know, I, I, what, I, what I have here that I can't get there is, is this great riding, and dirt bike riding is, is what I grew up doing, and I still love doing it. The scale of the Canning Stock Route is epic. Right in the heart of Western Australia, the track extends 1,850 kilometres from Woolloona in the south to Halls Creek in the beautiful Kimberley region to the north. We will cross some 800 sand dunes and four deserts. The Tanami, Great Sandy, Little Sandy and Gibson Deserts. Our journey will take 14 days to complete and the route is wildly beautiful with freshwater springs creating astonishing oases in literally the middle of nowhere. There are a total of 51 wells, all with their own story to tell. Day one, and it's a very early start for everyone. The group left Perth on a 6am flight to the starting point of the Canning Stock Route, the township of Waluna. At day's end, there are sure to be a few tied bodies amongst this group. It's great to meet everyone for the first time, and after the introductions, it's time for the first group photo before we climb on board the Hondas and head out. Day one is massive, some 215 kilometres at Sea of Sleeve Waluna, heading due north for Well 6, also known as Pier Springs. Our Iveco support truck will make use of the road access via Granite Peak Station and will meet up at Well 5. All going to plan, we should be in just before dark. Uh, I don't do much of a talk, boys. It's sort of enjoy yourselves and ride at your own capabilities. We are, as you all know, we're in a pretty remote area, so um, RFDS say canning stock route, minimum of half day, sometimes a day for help. So it's something to always keep in mind. It's pretty, pretty long time. Um, it's beautiful, stunning ride. We pause with a mixture of excitement and anticipation with the distances we are yet to cover. After leaving Maluna, we ride 28 kilometres before turning off and joining the Canning Stock Route. Well, two. Here we are. After another group photo, it's time to get familiar with the train and our bikes. 50 to go. 49 to see. 49 more to see. You know, it, it's, it's funny because you're buzzing down this trail, right side to side, so you can see far enough down to be able to commit to the speed you're doing. And then you see something, mm, it looks like it's you slow down, make the corner, and then it's just rocks and a ravine and up and hand up and ledge. It, it, there's, I mean, it's, it's a, the biggest variety of terrain um, I've, I've seen maybe in a day of riding in a long time. Out here, you expect to see four drives and motorcycles but we were all a little bit surprised to come across someone from Europe on a home-built bamboo bike. Oh, yeah, right on. Hey, have fun, stay safe. Yeah, yeah. Happy travel, safe travel. Thank you. You too, buddy. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah. I'll show you. Shock, <laughs> 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 Blows me away. Got me soft. <laughs> <laughs> 
From well five, we enter the Barilla-Baru determination, which is an indigenous protected area where their country extends from well five to 15 and permits are required beyond this point. It's about, I reckon for me, there's about five wells on the Canning Stock route that are pretty. Some certainly probably have more history. Um, indigenous folk being born at wells. At this place, beautiful big gums. You have a look at these, um, how beautiful the water is. We're in the desert. Oh, this. There in the water and the sea. Beautiful. Hello. As the sun sets on our first day on the canning, we unpack the truck and make camp. We're absolutely exhausted and enjoy a fantastic steak dinner around the campfire, ready to do it all again tomorrow. It's a tough journey. I'd hate to, th to, to have thought what they would have gone through to, to get to each well back in the day. Um, it's, it's been an amazing experience on the motorbike, but yeah, to do it on horseback would be a tough journey. Today's journey takes us past six wells and the historical site of John Forrest's fort. Then we head past Lake Aerodrome before making camp at Well 12, another great camp where fresh water is available. The advantage of travelling by bike is the free-flowing nature and the amount of ground we can cover very easily. This gives us plenty of time to stop at each of the wells, rest and enjoy the sights and sounds the canning has to offer. Passing Well 8, we ride into John Forrest's Fort, an area steeped in history and now classified a reserve. We are surprised to be greeted by a herd of cattle roaming free. This area is also known as Glen Isle Station, where in 1947, Henry Ward was granted a lease and moved 300 head of cattle here. Not surprising, there are cattle yards and a windmill pumping water. Water was first discovered here in a nearby creek in 1874 by John Forrest and Tommy Pierre, claiming it to be one of the best water sources they had seen. The exploring party was attacked by Aboriginals and forced to build a thatched stone fort for protection, which still partly stands today. While the rest of the team ride the Honda CRF 450X, I have chosen to ride the Africa Twin. It might be over 200 kilos, but it's more than capable out here and sure keeps me busy. We arrive at our overnight spot, Well 12 a great opportunity to wash away the dust from our faces with some beautiful crystal clear water. We set up camp and it's not long before we are joined by the local rangers. This is a great chance to find out the history of this area, share stories from both our past, but you look we started. <laughs> show them our motorcycles and take time to understand the key role the Aboriginal rangers play here today. Uh, so g'day, my name's Hamish Morgan and this is Ivan Wongwall and we're part of the Birrily Buru Ranger Team and we work to look after this country. It's a beautiful big country, it's 6.6 .6 million hectares which is almost the size of Tasmania. This is what is called an um, Indigenous Protected Area um, and about 60, I think 67% of Australia's natural um, reserves are now Indigenous protected areas. So Indigenous people are at the, at the sort of forefront of conservation management um, across us here. And one of the things we do is, is, is fire management. Um, when his people were living on country, they were always lighting fires. That's how they looked after the country. That's how they managed the resources looked after the food, that's how they communicated with each other, was with fire. That's how they kept the country safe from the big summer fires. But since people stopped living out here full time, 
those big fires have started again. Part of our work is trying to keep those, break up those big areas of unburnt spin effects, break it up so that those, when the lightning strike does come, because it's always going to come, um, the fires don't get too big. And hopefully as, as the canning stock route grows and as more tourists inevitably will come out here, it's more about that connection. That, you know, White Australia gets that opportunity to, to meet ranger teams and to hear the awesome work they're doing out here to look after the country. Not only for their people, but they're looking after it for all Australians. You know, this is an important conservation estate for, 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 the, for the nation. And these guys are at the forefront of, of managing it. And yeah, the riding has been exceptional, more than I thought. I've done the Simpson quite a few times. My brother done this in his car on his own um, 17 years ago. I thought, yeah, I'll do it on a bike with Daryl. And um, he said, oh, it'll be about five times as hard as the Simpson, but I think it might be eight times as hard. <laughs> it's just consistent, doesn't stop. Today we head for one of the most beautiful spots on the canning, Durba Springs, where we will meet the Martu Ranger team. The riding today sees us further into the desert and increased sand. Our distance today, 145 kilometres of pure dirt bike heaven. Riding into the sun, the air is crisp and cool, but the sand is starting to get the group's attention and keep everyone warm by working as hard on the bike. The riding is challenging, and always testing the group with terrain changing quickly. From deep sand, then to the big washouts after recent rains, and back to gravel and rock. Yeah, it's been good so far. Nice and cool, a little bit. Sleep well? You know, I uh, slept pretty good till about four o'clock, and then I would just, and I got, cause I think I woke up when I was cold. I never really got back over that. So I never got back to sleep again, but yeah, it was all right. We went to bed 9.30, something like that, so it wasn't, wasn't too late of a night. And the riding today, pretty good? Been fun, you know, some deep sand, some, some pretty big ripples in the road, lots of corrugation, so, you know, the deep sand keeps it kind of wandering around and walking around the whole time. Just remember, the more throttle you give it, the better it gets, so. At Well 14, there is a visitor's book which we all take the time to sign, leaving our mark on the canning. From here we push on and the terrain remains tricky. Even Swats is caught out here by the ball bearing like gravel. The canning stock route has many stories to tell over its history and today we come across a group of volunteers fixing Well 15, making it safe for both travellers and the wildlife, ensuring good quality water continues to be available for all. Well, I suppose my journey started 18 years ago. Um, a good friend of ours, he was a well driller and it was his idea. He, um, come out on the canning and he decided he'd come and he'd actually fix this particular well up. It was a chosen because it was firstly good water and it was not particularly deep to the limestone so not a lot of resource wood had to be brought out. And then in the meantime we, we, had, we fell in love with the idea of coming out here doing this sort of work. And we did several other wells along the track. The red gum sleevers that we did use have rotted and the top had become unsafe. We've uh, decided, well, we'll fix this. Well 15, and we did the same to well 49. <laughs> you got beer in there? Good water. Yeah. <laughs> Good water, yeah. As we continue north, we pass into Matu country. The sand gets deeper and the dunes get bigger. The scenery continues to change and it's absolutely spectacular on the way to Well 16 and all the way into Durba Springs. At Durba Springs we are greeted by an oasis in the desert, a wildly beautiful place surrounded by cliffs and pools of water. The area is steeped in the history of the canning with Aboriginal rock paintings, 
and the markings from the first explorers clearly evident on the rock faces of the springs. A very popular spot, there are many other groups camped here with us for the night, including a team of rangers from Parks and Wildlife. 5.45am, first light is just coming and it's freezing cold. I meet up and head out with the rangers for a very special morning where I get to take part in their wallaby capture and release program. So we're here um, at Durba Hills with the uh, ranger team here from Jigalong. Um, about three years ago we moved some rock wallabies from down south and we put them back here. Um, they went extinct in this range in uh, about the 1980s. Um, so this has been a collaborative project between Parks and Wildlife and, and KJ Rangers to um, bring them back home, bring them back to this range. Yeah, so each morning uh, we've already got the traps up in the, in the, in the rocks and um, these guys are really good animal handlers um, and work with a Parks and Wildlife person. So we grab the rock wallabies out of the traps and put them in bags, but then we also take some measurements of their feet, how, um, how much they weigh so that we make sure that they're, they're putting on weight. Um, also, just whether they're healthy, got nice coats, um, whether they're breeding, so we'll look in their pouch, see if they've got little ones, um, if they're boys, whether they're breeding or not. Um, and then we also microchip every single one so that we, next time we come, we know exactly who it is, whether they came from over there or they've been born and bred here. Um, and then we also take DNA just to make sure that we've got a good representation of animals and we're not getting um, any too much inbreeding. Today was um, a bit of a slow day, but we got three animals and it was a really good mix. One animal that was one of the originals that came across um, three years ago, and then we've got one that bred in that first year, and then we also got her young at foot. Um, so one, uh, two that have been born and bred on this range from the originals. So the guys are amazing. We um, put traps right up high in the, in the cliffs. Um, so it's a lot of work to get the, the traps up there. And then, yeah, we check them very early in the morning. Lots of um, hard work on your legs. Um, these guys come out here a lot and do lots and lots of hard work. So big trips. This area was home to many Aborigines and we take time to admire some very beautiful and significant rock art painted very close to the campsite. Today is going to be not only spectacular, but also tough and challenging. While we are only travelling 166 kilometres to Well 20, the terrain will test each of us. While we have been looking at the artwork, the truck has been on the road for two hours, making good time ahead of us. From here, the sand becomes not only very deep, but also incredibly soft, testing all the riders, including myself. How'd you find this morning on the sand? It's good, you know, the first bit was kind of tightened up a little bit with the trees. And had to dodge branches as much as you had to try and figure out how to re-ride this, how to ride sand again. I don't know, maybe it's, um, maybe it's too much dinner that makes me forget how to ride a motorcycle the next morning. Sure it's dinner? Yeah, well, maybe not. <laughs> so far, the bikes have been very reliable and no real issues. But this is the desert, and out here, help is a long way away. You have to expect the unexpected. Damn, must be down. What happened? The boys are gone. I just helped Tito. They just got on the edge of the track there. A rock got up between the stand and the back of the peg and smashed the sensor. So when you leave your stand down as a motorcycle rider, you know, put in gear, the engine cuts off. Well, that's what that was doing with the stand up. It smashed the back of the sensor. So I've just locked the wires together. And we're on our way. With the wires joined together, we are back in business. The sensor on the bike might be broken, but my sense of humour is firmly intact. Same for the boys in the truck. <laughs> Just my luck today. The only fall I've had and we happen to have two cameras shooting the whole thing. 
For an incredibly dry and arid country, there is a lot of water to be found up and down the Canning stock route. Savory Creek leads to Lake Disappointment, named in 1897 by Frank Hand, who, after following the creeks in the area, expected to find a large freshwater lake, thus naming it Lake Disappointment. We find a fantastic camping spot overlooking the lake. In fact, this would turn out to be a favourite amongst the boys. After a great dinner, we settle in around the campfire. Again, tell a few stories of the day's adventure, all extremely tired and ready for an early night. Day six greets us with seven camels meandering down the track. The ride today takes us 152 kilometres to well 25. This will mark roughly the halfway point in our journey. An early start and the team is starting to feel the effects of almost a week on the bike. Our lead rider Rocket has his hands on the big Africa twin for a few days with Kevin Swantz not far behind. We arrive at Georgia Bore, which was sunk in the 1990s for the use by the survey crews during the mineral exploration of this area. There is a photo opportunity with a few tourists passing through, then it's time for a bit of tucker. It is, it is a favourite. Someone loves, loves a barbie for, for lunch. Any preference yet? Hey, to be honest, at the moment, I'm probably leaning towards the Africa Twin. But um, that could change by this afternoon. Talk to me tonight and I could be worn out. Our journey takes us to some amazing countryside. Beautiful escarpments and rock formations. Millions of years old. Sometimes you just have to stop and enjoy the beauty of Outback Australia. Today is about midpoint, the canning. So if you want to say 1,800 kilometres, let's say 2,000 with Halls Creek and a little few extras we do. Uh, we generally change oils around the 1,000, so today marks our halfway point, so uh, CRF 450Xs run a separate gearbox and engine oil, so we change both to hold about 750 mil each. New, uh, new oil filter for the engine, and then tomorrow we'll be due for uh, change of air filters as well and we just monitor those depending on conditions but uh, I just find that the kit's easy for what we do. Yeah other than that they're, they're, they're pretty good chains and sprockets we get four and a half five thousand k's. These tyres have done Simpson in here the Michelin deserts are we find the longevity is good uh, and the wear rates pretty good well, you know, it's mainly sand country so um, but the service is a necessity to keep them going though it's tough conditions. The canning, it's a fantastic little story in itself, it's, and it's a big story in Australia. It's a pity we aren't taught it at school, but, you know, to be so adventurous way back in 1909 and put down 53-odd wells across, I think, 16 or 1,800 kilometres, it was a hell of a feat, and uh, they didn't have the luxury of, uh, you know, the four-wheel drives and all the things we've got right now, and, uh, you know, I think everyone should do it at least once in their life, yeah. Today we are riding just on 156 kilometres in typical desert country. This will continue to test everybody. We are aiming for well 30. We stop at Tiwa, well 26, and wait for the Oveco truck to arrive. They have done a brilliant job of rebuilding this well and have included a plaque dedicated to Alfred Canning. There is also a replica of a camel water tank that Canning would have had on his journey in 1906. Good, you know, it's been kind of a relaxed pace. Some, some big sand dunes that make you get up and work a little bit. But fun, as always, on a motorcycle, having a good time. And how was your night last night? You had fun? Yeah, you know, we had a pretty big storytelling session around the fire last night. It was pretty entertaining. So well 26, generally we run probably four days, 12 guys, uh, with our water. So uh, we, have, we have our backup water as well. So today we'll take on a load for the guys for showers uh, and our cooking and bits and pieces. So 
We'll pump it out now. There's little diagrams on the maps that generally indicate good water. Uh, and it's good for some of the wells too, you know, when they sit pump, pumping that water out and letting them flow. So um, we'll pump today and we'll pump again in four days' time. But this is one of the great things about the canning stock route is we're remote in the, uh, in the Gibson Desert at stages and we've got full supply of water from uh, those amazing people in the early 1900s that come through here and dug 51 of them. It's, it's a different day today. The sand somehow seems to have got softer overnight. It sounds crazy. <laughs> but then again, it's probably just my uh, fitness ride in the Africa Twin. I might, may be struggling a little bit today. Everyone has good and bad days. Today, it's Rocket Ronnie's turn to do it a bit tough on the bike. It doesn't seem to matter what you do, the harder you try to ride better, it just gets worse. Come on, big fella. While Ronnie does it tough, the truck does it slow. There are many obstacles and hidden rocks, sharp roots that can puncture the tyres. In this kind of soft sand, tyre pressures are low to give the Big Eye Veco a better footprint in the sand for better traction. The disadvantage is the sidewall on the tyre is extremely exposed. Compounding that is the vegetation that comes right to the edge of the track. While it's not very pleasant getting whipped by these branches on a bike, it also adds another element for the truck driver scooter to worry about. Well, in amongst all the trees and stuff we went through today, we've had a little tiny stick, which was, that's the culprit, that went bang. It was hanging out of that little bit of plastic there, which was the cover. So when we pulled up, it was like that, so. So this is a miniature one. We can fix this up, no worries, but at the same, at somewhere else, we've got a slit in the back tyre as well, so. As we pumped it up to park up for the night, the slit's let go and she's gone bang. So we'll jack her up and change the tyre and be all good tomorrow. All good, boys. We carry two spare tyres for this very reason. So as we get the spare down, Larry Perkins sets about fixing the airline issue that could potentially slow the progress of the truck if we don't get it fixed. So we've just cut that piece of hose out that had a hole in it. As it turns out, it's quite a good bit of hose with wire reinforcing and everything, so we've just been very unlucky that that stick has hit it right on the, the point of the barb, which has yeah, pierced the hose. So. All good. We're back in the game. Thanks for a bit of help from LP, and we'll get the next one sorted in a minute. While changing the tyre is not a big issue when you have many hands to help, we were certainly lucky the tyre held up until camp. Had Scooter and Brad done this change alone on the track, we all might have been waiting a little bit longer for dinner. There's been no pressure. That's that's another thing I like about this tour. There's no pressure to do anything. Like like Daryl let us set our bikes up the way we wanted them and get up into the morning. There's no real come on boys, hurry up, we're on our way. But it's just great. No pressure. I think I'm more rested than when I started. The riding today has us going past five wells, finishing at well 35. It's about 155 kilometres of dirt bike heaven. We will stop at the Aboriginal community of Coonawarraji for fuel, then back onto the canning. After the tough going yesterday, we are hoping for a slightly easier run in the sand. The group take no time in getting up to speed this morning and are getting along at a pretty good pace. The truck, on the other hand, is finding the going slow. Might have something to do with the tenth packet of biscuits. Well, 31 and there's not much left. Some rusted metal and a hole in the ground. One of the things I love, it doesn't matter how hard it gets, there's always time for a good laugh. There you go. Don't friggin' hammer it when you take off. <laughs> he said hammer it oh. when you take <laughs> off. Ha, 
<laughs> we arrive at Kunawaraji for fuel and have to wait for the truck before we can fuel up. This gives the boys a chance to buy a few sweets and the odd meat pie fresh from the pie warmer. The truck arrives and we fill both the petrol and the diesel tanks. At $3.40 per litre, this is one fuel bill that's going to hurt. But out here, there's certainly no choice. We leave Kunawaraji and head to our next stop, one that is very close to the heart of Kevin Swamps. Our day ends like every other in the desert, around the campfire, eating, relaxing, a few beers, and enjoying the magnificent night sky. The canning compared to The Simpson is a much bigger challenge, and, and um, really, for anybody thinking about doing it, um, I'd advise that you make sure that you're quite fit and have had a decent amount of experience in the sand, and I certainly wouldn't overrate myself. And the reason I'm saying that is, um, of course, you'll still make it because you know a person with average skills will get through, but I don't think you're going to enjoy it anywhere near as much as you probably should if you um, don't have the right preparation. So I think that's pretty important. From Well 35, we continue our journey and plan on making Well 39 today. So far, the weather has been perfect, if a little cool in the mornings. Out here, the riding is pretty remote. Other cars, while still present, tend to be few and far between. Today, it was a lone camel on the track we had to deal with. Camels are a huge problem across the deserts in Australia, and they compete for food and water with the native wildlife. They've also been known to go to extreme lengths to find water. Last night we camped at Well 35. This is Wanda, Well 36. And two years ago when we were here, a camel had fallen into this well. And that's why there's frames here, because uh, they pulled it out. So the water was a bit, a bit grubby back then. And someone's kindly put this frame over just to keep the bigger animals out or to stop them from falling in. But uh, every now and then the older wells that aren't restored, like some of the new ones that you've seen, uh, they have lids on them, whereas these ones don't. So, um, but the water's still good, you can still use it if you know what to do with it. During the first drove on the canning, 150 or so bullocks were being driven by George Shoesmith, James Thompson, Fred Tyrone, and a part Aborigine called Chinaman. After Fred Tyrone headed back to Halls Creek due to illness, the remaining men pushed on to Well 37, where they were later found speared by natives. The graves have been preserved in close proximity to Well 37 and are not far from that of Jock McLennan's, a prospector who died in 1922 after being clubbed to death by Aborigines. Well 37 is known as the Haunted Well. The riding is tough and we push on through the desert as the dunes start to become more frequent. We arrive at Well 39, certainly not one of the prettiest wells on the canning, but we are greeted with a warm, curious hello from some of the locals. Tonight, while sound asleep, we would learn a very valuable lesson. I really like this country. It's sort of got a little bit of everything, and the riding it's probably the best riding you, you would ever do. And if you like sand, <laughs> this is excess. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, 12 days of just solid riding. And, and also, you meet a great bunch of uh, people, like-minded, they're into trail riding, etc. And the nighttime camps and fires are, um, yeah, good to relax and tell some stories of the day, enjoy a beer. So I, I very much like it. That's why, I'm, yeah, I'm here again. Today is a relatively short day with just 100 kilometres of riding. We leave the dingoes behind at Well 39 and make our way slowly. There is some real history in this area to be seen. Overnight, the dingoes have stolen shoes, thongs, and even chewed Dave's glove. We'll have to make sure we put everything away at night from now on. As we head out of camp, Steve is having a blast on the Africa Twin today as we head towards Tobin's grave. This is quite a significant spot in terms of the history on the canning. LP for me on the canning stock route. 
I don't know why. It's, it's it certainly the landscape's very different from when I was here a couple of years with the burn. It's quite barren, but Tobin's grave here. I've always enjoyed staying here, and I think it's because of the the history and what went on around this area with him. Yes, it's, it is good. This is the facts. I mean, I've got the Bible on the. Uh, story here from the Royal Commission documents that Phil Bianchi's put together and it says that uh, Canning uh, didn't have his revolver with him when he came across Tobin with confronted with a Aboriginal and uh, he was unarmed and he called Mick to shoot and uh, Toby fired his rifle at the same instant that the native uh, threw his spear and they both got each other and uh, it, it appears that they surprised each other mm. and they both thought the other one was hostile but it is interesting to um, you know, have the real facts on what's happened here. Yeah. Yeah. Day 10's been short, but it has been a great day in the desert. Day 11 and today we're riding 124 kilometres to well 46. First thing I think of is Valentino Rossi. As we've been heading further north, the days are becoming much warmer, but the fatigue is really starting to set in amongst the group. And this is when mistakes can be made. Up this end of the canning, there are some beautiful rock escarpments. And if you look hard enough, you'll see the history of the Aboriginal people in this area. This is the stuff I love about Western Australia, and especially the canning stock route. You know, you imagine, you know, the last nomads come out, what was it, early 80s. Um, I think they were living in these places. You know, it's, it's, probably 32 degrees outside today. Um, we're between well 44 and 45, so we get to the top. And it's quite cool and nice in here because of the rock, you feel the rock, it's quite cold. You can see where they've been burning their fires. Obviously when it's been cool, the charcoal on the ceilings, but it's still paintings in here. Um, it's truly amazing. It's, um, I think it's something we need to show all our kids as well. It's a uh, pretty special place. The sand certainly doesn't get any easier, but our bodies are feeling it after almost two weeks on the bikes. It happens in an instant. The front wheel gets caught in a rut left by one of the leading bikes, and you find yourself over the bars. On this type of ride, given the distance and the difficulty, everyone falls off at some stage, and we've been fortunate no one has been hurt. In this case, Steve is winded and will have a few bruised ribs to let him know he's still alive over the next few days. Paul's Creek's not very far away and reality hits us that our journey is almost over. Day 12 and while we are only going two wells and 98 kilometres, there will be plenty of time to look around and enjoy the stunning rock formations in this part of Australia. It's great to have the time to stop and admire the view early and get a good sense how vast this land is. We continue on and make our way to Breeden Pool. This is another oasis in the desert and we'll all feel we could easily be on the east coast of Australia somewhere. We set up camp next to an amazing rock formation. The setting sun hitting the rock really brings out the red and looks awesome. This is one of my favourite spots in the canning, as to me this feels like outback Australia. Just beautiful. This is it, the final day on the canning stock route. The magnificent meteorite crater at Wolf Creek is our destination today. We've got to cover 251 kilometres, though much of that is transport. After the last 12 days, it should be easy. The countdown is almost complete. After leaving camp, we hit well 48, then 49, well 50, and finally the last well on the canning stock route, well 51. We pose for our final group photo, have a bite to eat, then head towards Wolf Creek. We've all heard plenty about Wolf Creek and seen the movie, but despite the bloody handprint on the sign, Wolf Creek is amazing and the crater is something to be seen and underlines just how old this land here really is. We take in the view, take a few photos and head to our final camp. The journey has been epic, but each one of us achieved a personal goal and that was to finish the canning. 
on the bike and in one piece. It's another tick on the bucket list for all the riders here and one they should all be very proud of. While we are not far from Halls Creek, this is where our journey really ends. We've all made new friends and shared experiences along the way. For me, I'm pleased to have been able to take a group of people into the outback for an experience they'll never forget. The Australian outback is such a special place, not only for us travellers that are willing to take on the challenges the outback presents, but also the people that call this home. I'd like to say a special thank you to the Aboriginal people and communities up and down the Canning Stock Route that allowed us into their backyard and also showed us how beautiful this part of the world really is. Our trip wouldn't have been possible without the support of some really great people and companies. Glenn Griffiths, Honda Motorcycles Australia. The team at Aveco Trucks. Shannon Insurance for coming on board this project. Alan Brightman, Sun Studio, CPS, and Canon Australia for your continued support of cameras and lenses. Alpine Stars, thanks for coming on board. You kept us protected and warm up the Canning Stock Group. And I'd really personally like to thank my old teammate and world champion, Kevin Swans, for coming along on this great adventure. And remember, if you want to join me on an adventure, darrellbeattyadventures.com.au. In the meantime, I'm heading to Cape York, and remember, travel safe. <laughs>